So good morning. My name is David Howell, and I am your worship associate for today. And our gathering music is page 395. If you'll open to that, please, since I have some directions for you. We're going to sing this as a round led by the choir who presumably knows what they're who presumably knows what they're doing. So if the choir will come up and I will step down. So we will sing this through once together and then that side will begin and that side will join in with them for the round. You'll see circled one, two, three, and four. At two, the side come in. Got that? Sing it through once all together. And then this side will begin at one. And at two, this side will begin at one. Three times, at three times through, yes. So I will be a busy beaver for the first part of this, jumping down for the choir and back up again. Welcome. This is West Side Unitarian Universalist. I run into people, by the way, who don't know what either Unitarian or Universalist means. Uh, Unitarian, by the way, simply means there is just one God. Uh, not three, or three versions of one, or however Trinitarians view that. Lots of you grew up in a Trinitarian church and know what that's about. And it is the universalist part, which is really much nicer, that everyone rejoins the source of things, and as good you use, that source can be whatever is in your mind. We are not concerned about the creeds that you believe in or the way in which you put it. You simply wish to come together to enjoy this beautiful spring day. There are lots of announcements in the order of service, and you can look at them. I do want to mention one, the Death Cafe, which is next Saturday uh, from 3 to 5. Um, I'm planning on coming to that, and I think it might be fun if one wants to talk about death anyway, if one can do that in a fairly jovial manner or whatever kind of manner. <laughs> And now we will sing our opening hymn. We're going to sit at the welcome table number 407. The choir would join us.
notice uh, that the next thing here says chalice lighting. Actually, the next thing is to uh, ring the uh, bowl. I've said this many times before. This is a chance to stop, sit, center yourselves, relax, take a breath, appreciate this beautiful morning that we have together. And are you going to light the chalice then, Helen? Thank you very much. We have a special treat for the reading, a poem that Helen wrote for the occasion. While the chalice is being lit, the central flame and one for some happy things and one for some sad things. I made the mistake of watching the news this morning, so there are lots of sad things to go on, but here there are only happy things. Fog lifts, we lift. We find what we are looking for with our hands, if not our eyes. I think we have to keep asking ourselves, where is the joy? Joy dances in the fog blissfully unaware of search parties, desperately calling her name. Why would she notice she is too busy dancing, weaving herself into the undercurrent of despair? She does not know sorrow, only dancing, tiptoeing through nightmares, sprinkling hope and fairy dust on even the deepest of wounds. Joy dances in the fog, peeking through the underbrush, watching the aimless wander by, one by one, always alone in their seeking. She twirls in the moonlight, wondering when we will realize that she is not hiding, she is not missing, she is not far, we will find what we are seeking if only we can be determined to wonder where is the joy. If only we can be determined to find the places where her feet have blessed the earth, to find her fairy dust, to realize she was never gone, she was simply dancing in the fog. Thank you. Oh, wow. I'm too short for that. There we go. All right, my friends. Hi. I'm so glad y'all are here today. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about the journey of becoming a Unitarian Universalist minister today. That's something I've been working on for about, oh gosh. I started in 2018, so going on six years. Um, but before that, I want to actually invite Suzanne and Ellen. I have a job for you. Now, has anybody ever heard me preach before? Morgan, Chris, couple of y'all. Uh, what do you think is like the number one piece of feedback I get when I preach? Uh, you speak too fast. Yes, I speak too fast. I have gotten that feedback literally every single time I have been in the pulpit over the last six years. And that's okay. I'm not perfect. I'm still learning. Uh, so I would like to employ my friends here to take one of these flags during the service. If I start speaking too fast, I want you to wave the flag. It will not hurt my feelings. I like, I really want that feedback during the service instead of after it. So I can actually, actually accommodate because I want y'all to hear what I'm saying. <laughs> All right, I'm going to switch over this one. Can you hear me? 
All right. So this process of becoming a UU minister is intense, y'all. Um, I have a game that we're gonna play here in just a minute, but to set the stage, I'm gonna, um, gonna explain a little bit of what goes into it. So the process is overseen by the Ministerial Fellowship Committee of the UUA, um, and the UUA is like the central organization of Unitarian Universalism. Um, I, when I tried to explain it to my Catholic grandma, I said it's kind of like the Vatican, but not remotely as intense, just like that central organization. Um, and there's three phases of the initial process. There is aspirant status, candidate status, and then preliminary fellowship. Um, I'm currently in aspirant status. I hope to be moving into um, candidate status by the end of the year. And if everything goes according to plan, about this time next year, we're gonna be starting to talk about planning my ordination. <laughs> yes, we're, we're getting there. Um, okay, so we have a huge list of requirements to get to preliminary fellowship, and then that's the stage when you're considered an official UU minister. Now, this is a very condensed version of the process, um, so don't come at me. It's not super detailed, um, but we're going to focus on what it takes to be considered an official UU minister in preliminary fellowship today. Um, so we're going to play a game. You should, or around you, there are some green cards. Each one of those green cards has something written on it. It is either a requirement, if it's a requirement, it says requirement in bold, or it's a potential barrier or a requirement to meet a requirement. So what we have here, and it's okay if you don't have one, there's, there, I think there's 26 total, not everybody was gonna get one. What we have here is a game board of the process. So you'll see these bolded ones, these are the big requirements. We have, you know, th we have uh, three to six years in seminary, 400 hours of CPE, a one to two year internship. But then there's some other stuff on here that might make that process harder. So I'm gonna get us started. I'm gonna go ahead and um, give us discernment. Let's go ahead and pretend we're already on the, on the path. So what we're gonna do is go one at a time to uh, through here. And I'm gonna call out whoever has that card. You can bring it up or hold it up and I will come get it if you don't wanna come up here. And you're gonna trade it for a little check mark. Now, a couple of these check marks have glitter on them. If you draw a glitter check mark, that's privilege and you get to skip some barriers. You get to skip barriers to the next um, thing. So we're gonna see how this goes. We are in discernment, we've done that. Who has a letter of recommendation from a UU minister in full fellowship? All right, do you wanna bring it up or I can come get it? Oh no. <laughs> oh, I got it, I got it. All right, thank you. I'm gonna trade it for a check mark. All right, and if you wanna put the check mark right here, sorry, on the requirement. Fantastic, thank you. Who has 100 to $200 for a background check? All right. So that, thank you so much. You wanna grab a, grab a thing and pop it up here. Got a regular one right here, thank you. All right, who's got a background check? All right. Thank you. This is just like, this is before you're even in anywhere. Another regular check mark. Who has access to a home congregation? Thank you. All right, who has a relationship with a home congregation? It's Ellen. I'm gonna pop that one right here and draw your check mark. It's the next one, thank you. All right, who has formal sponsorship by a home congregation? Jerry, thank you. Westside became my official sponsor in the MFC process in 2020, I believe. Thank you. Draw your check mark and you're gonna pop it right here. MFC is the Ministerial Fellowship Committee. This is the, the big thing that oversees it. Fantastic, who has undergraduate education? Thank you, Morgan. 
It is like bingo. Oh, it's glittery. Oh, you got a glitter one. Yay, you get to skip a barrier. So we're going to go next to who has $50,000 for seminary tuition. All right, come on up. Yeah, basically. All right. $50,000 in student loans for seminary tuition right here. Thank you so much. Right here, yeah, because we got to skip that last one because Morgan got a sparkly one. Thank you. All right, next, who has accepting that the colleagues deciding your career future get total access to a report of your health, trauma, and mental ill health histories? Thank you. Yes, yeah, so as part of this process, we undergo a complete psychological evaluation called a career assessment. Thank you, right here. And the report of that gets sent to the entire MFC. Um, and they review it in depth and in detail and ask you questions about it. <laughs> Who has $1,500 for that psychological evaluation? Hi, Mary. Thank you. You can grab a check mark, whichever one you want, and you're going to go right here. <coughs> Thank you. Who has a comprehensive psychological evaluation? Anybody? Here we go. Right. Thank you. Yes. Oh, yeah, Psych uh, career assessment. You're right. Thank you. Right here. Thank you so much. Oh, you're, oh, you're perfect. You're perfect. Um, who has three to six years of seminary? Or an MDiv degree, sorry, Master of Divinity degree. Hmm, what does this one say? Oh, yep. Sorry, 90 hours of graduate school to complete seminary in three to six years, yes. Sorry, I changed it up a little bit. All right, who has $8,000 to $12,000 to replace 400 hours of income? That's to complete clinical pastoral education. No, not yet, not yet, I'll get that one next, all right. All right, $8,000 to $12,000 to supplement income during CPE, perfect, thank you. All right, another regular one. Not too many glitter ones happening today. Thank you. Who has $700 to $2,000 for clinical pastoral education tuition? Thanks, Morgan. If it seems like it's taking a long time, that's kind of the point. Oh, Morgan is all about it. Okay, so Morgan got another glitter check mark, so we get to skip. $6,000 plus for 400 hours of childcare to complete CPE. And we're gonna skip straight to 400 hours of CPE, which I think Nathan said he had. You want me to get it for you? Thank you. And remind us what CPE Sorry, CPE is clinical pastoral education. So um, that is where uh, you go for about 12 weeks full time and serve as a hospital chaplain and complete an education course while you're doing that. So it is 100 hours of supervision in a classroom and 300 hours of clinicals one on one with people providing pastoral care. All right, who has um, 50, 50 plus required books? Thank you. I got right here. All right. Who has one to three part time jobs to supplement the internship stipend? Thank you, Jonas. You want to grab your check mark and you're going to put that one right here. Thank you, sir. All right, who has access to an internship site? Thank you. All right, who has a one to two year internship? Thank you. I think that's this one. It says one year full time, two years part 
yes, that's it. So um, there are a couple ways we can do it. We can do one year full time, two years or two years part time. Most people like to just get it done if we can. Thank you. I'm tired already. Uh, me too. <laughs> yeah. Good. I'm glad it's. I'm glad it's making sense. All right. So who has the MFC paperwork packet and two hundred and fifty dollars for an appointment fee? Thanks, Yetta. All right, who has a six month wait for an MFC appointment? Judy. <laughs> it takes a while, right? Look, I'm only on phase one and I've been in it for six years. You're gonna go right down here. Thank you, ma'am. Who has the MFC interview? All right. Thank you, Lynn. Let me put that right there, thank you. And who has ordination? Yes. All right, grab that last check mark. Thank you so much. So there's a lot there, huh? <laughs> the last word is stole. So this is making a minister start to stole, but it got a little messy. That's why I added the glitter so the L was a little more legible. And show us where you so where I am. Yeah, so I'm... So each one of these barriers, that's some, somewhere that someone like me has dropped out of the process. There are more UU ministers who have dropped out of the process than there are UU ministers who have completed it. And each one of these barriers are a reason that someone doesn't get to follow their call. Right now, I completed seminary last year. I've done my psych evaluation in my undergrad. And right now, I'm str <laughs> what I'm struggling with is how to replace eight to twelve thousand dollars in income so I can take CPE, um, CPE tuition. I can probably handle, but I'm gonna need help with six thousand plus uh, dollars for four hundred hours of childcare, and so on and so forth. I'm lucky that there are some internship site options in Knoxville, but um, I'm glad that this kind of demonstrated that it's kind of a big deal. It's a lot, and a lot goes into it, and. Actually, even with all of this, there's still something missing. Um, and that's actually what the sermon is about, is this thing that's missing that's absolutely critical for success. So if anybody needs a wiggle break, do that real quick, and I'm going to get up here. Yes, Henry, yes, Morgan. I love a good wiggle. Before I get started on that, like, what does, what do y'all think of that? Do you have questions? Do you have responses? Are you like, whoa, why? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't either. Okay. All right. So if I haven't gotten the chance to meet you formally yet, my name is Helen. My pronouns are they, them, and theirs, and I am a Unitarian Universalist, religious professional, and minister in formation. I also like to say pastor in progress. Um, I'm a solo parent to eight-year-old Henry and two cats, Rumi and Danny Danger, who are both very spoiled, and my hobbies include writing, photography, baking, and this week my hobby was rescuing a bee that I found during the eclipse, um, and that's been fun. They're actually still in my kitchen right now drinking little drops of sugar water in my basil plant. Um, I've been a member of Westside since 2011, and I began, began the process of becoming a UU minister in 2018. I moved to Florida in 2019 in pursuit of that goal, where I served the UU Church of Tallahassee as Director of Religious Education for four years as I attended seminary. I earned my master's 
at, from a Unitarian Universalist Identity Seminary, Star King School for the Ministry in 2023. And my degree is actually not a Master of Divinity, Divinity degree. It is um, Religious Leadership for Social Change uh, with a focus on religious education. So I'm actually going to end up going back and taking a few more classes to make up those requirements. I heard my kid talking. <sighs> For my thesis project, I wrote a small group ministry curriculum about trauma and trauma response. And that was entitled On Agape Trauma and the Beloved Community, which I hope to turn into a book one day. Currently, I am working a lot. Um, I serve Temple Beth Israel in Macon, Georgia as Temple Administrator. High Street UU Church in Macon, Georgia as media specialist, handling all their social media and communications. Um, I'm doing some writing and sensitivity reading for UU Wellspring, which uh, creates UU small group curricula. And I am the editor for the UUA's upcoming Mosaic anti-racism curriculum. Um, also do some freelance photography and social media consulting on the side. And I published my first book of poetry, Something Resembling God, um, last year. And I will have a sermon that I wrote about my coming out experience featured in an upcoming anthology from Skinner House of essays from queer Unitarian Universalists. I was quite pleased and surprised to learn recently that a poem I wrote entitled Blessed Are the Queer has become considered something akin to you, you, and queer liturgy. I did the thing you're never supposed to do, I Googled myself, and I found that this poem has transcended denominations, and it's been used in truly countless pride services over the past few years. Um, I got about five pages deep in Google seeing this poem show up in services from Mennonite communities, from all kinds of brands of Christian communities, in all kinds of pride celebrations, and it was bizarre and wonderful. Um, I realized that that poem, that my writing, that my ministry is bigger than me last year um, at an interfaith pride service in Macon. Um, the organizers didn't know that H.P. Rivers, which is my writing name, my pen name, um, they didn't know that I was local or that I would be there. And I had the strange honor of watching a crowd of worshipers react in real time to my words. It was a holy moment for me. I've wanted to be a writer since I wrote my first poem at eight years old, and it feels bizarre and beautiful that I finally arrived as I prepare to slide into 31 next weekend. I've spent the last five years away from Knoxville, working in faith communities, attending seminary, and learning way more than I expected about answering a call to serve God and her people. As a UU and a lifelong skeptic, I never expected to proclaim a belief in God. And for a long time, I was one of the ones that cringed when somebody said it. Even when I was a newbie in AA once upon a time, the whole idea of a higher power felt like an attack on my intelligence as well as my agency. And those are two things I've noticed UUs really can't stand. To be clear, I don't expect anyone else to share my perspective. This is my take on God, not a UU take on God. But I found for myself a deep belief and a deep comfort in surrendering to the idea of God as a love energy, a love energy from which all things originate and to which all things return. I think that source probably transcends our human ability to understand it. I think that's probably part of the point. And human experience ex experiences exist on a spectrum of love to distance from love, or God to distance from God. I know the God of my understanding isn't always the same as others, but often we can connect over the core concept of a benevolent higher power. The difference for me is I don't believe that we are something separate from God. 
I believe we are all unique representations of the divine experiencing itself, and we all deserve to exist accordingly. And that's all well and good until we actually have to exist in the world together. <laughs> right up until your inherent worth and dignity bumps up against my inherent worth and dignity, and we are tasked with coexisting in a vacuum of capitalism and binary thinking. It's a rough world out there. It's hard to look at my newsfeed some days, just knowing I can never be truly prepared for the next thing. Just when I think it can't get harder, it does. Just when I think the world can't get uglier, it does. Just when I decide to look away, the little voice in the back of my head says, don't do it. You are so privileged. The least you can do is witness. And then eventually, my mental health takes a nosedive from witnessing atrocity after atrocity, interspersed with ads for weight loss drugs and photos of my friend's pets. It feels hopeless sometimes to hold space for the divinity of all beings while my heart is breaking for the suffering of the world. It feels too big and too hard to really feel and really witness the enormity of the world's grief. What do we do with the enormous grief that exists in the world? especially when it often exists simultaneously with enormous joy and enormous disparity. What do we do about a hurting world and broken systems, all of which are so much bigger than any one person or community? I mentioned earlier that there was an ingredient missing from our recipe for a UU minister over here. And I'd say that that last ingredient that's super necessary to make a successful UU minister and to do something about our hurting world and broken systems is the same thing, beloved community. That's what this last card says. If you're not familiar, the beloved community is a concept that was popularized by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I can't explain it any better than the King Center already has, so uh, the following is an excerpt from their website. It says, Dr. King's beloved community is a global vision in which all people can share in the wealth of the earth. In the beloved community, Poverty, hunger, and homelessness will not be tolerated because international standards of human decency will not allow it. Racism and all forms of discrimination, bigotry, and prejudice will be, will be replaced by an all-inclusive spirit of sisterhood and brotherhood. In the beloved community, international disputes will be resolved by peaceful conflict resolution and reconciliation of adversaries instead of military power. Love and trust will triumph over fear and hatred. Peace with justice will prevail over war and military conflict. Dr. King's beloved community was not devoid of interpersonal, group, or international conflict. Instead, he recognized that conflict was an inevitable part of human experience. But he believed that conflicts could be resolved peacefully and adversaries could be reconciled through mutual, determined commitment to nonviolence. No conflict, he believed, need erupt in violence and all conflicts in the beloved community should end with reconciliation of adversaries cooperating together in a spirit of friendship and goodwill. Now that is a tall order. It might even sound like a pipe dream or like some idealistic woke nonsense that hippie white girls with healing crystals stuffed in their bras would post on Instagram. I'm not saying it's easy, but I am saying it's possible. 
and I am living proof. Going through this formation process as a first-generation college student and as a neurodivergent solo parent of a neurodivergent child, this has often felt like playing life on hard mode. <laughs> and that was before the pandemic. I mentioned earlier that I'm finally at a point in my career where I'm starting to feel as if I've accomplished some important goals. What I didn't mention is that it is a bona fide miracle that I am still upright and I wouldn't be without my beloved community. I'm not sure I ever would have accepted or believed that I am enough to be a minister if my minister hadn't steadfastly and insistently affirmed that I am enough. I never would have written my first sermon if a fellow West Sider, Miss Ellen, hadn't read my blog and casually suggested that I should give a sermon sometime. If I'd never written that sermon, I wouldn't have shown it to a local UU community minister. He wouldn't have said, wow, you can preach. And I wouldn't have left that coffee shop determined to apply for, to seminary. If I'd never applied to seminary, I wouldn't have met one of my dearest friends in our very first class. Her presence in my life is a gift and a balm, and I never would have made it through seminary without her. She never misses a chance to speak my name in rooms full of opportunities. And two of the positions I currently hold are thanks to her recommendation. Those positions gave me the stability to move back home to Knoxville, which I also couldn't have done without my best friend and his husband, who waited over a year for me to be ready to leave my abusive marriage and came running to help me pack and move when it was finally time. When it was time, I couldn't have afforded the lawyer who helped me navigate the divorce and ensure I got to keep my two cats that my ex was threatening without my colleagues in trust, which stands for Transgender Religious Professional Unitarian Universalists Together. It's a professional association for trans UU religious professionals. They helped me raise the funds um, for my attorney through a mutual aid campaign that was supported by my friends, colleagues, and even a few of y'all here at Westside. And none of that, none of this, none of this would have happened if Westside hadn't been here to welcome me with open arms when I needed a soft place to land. This soft place to land became an anchor as I navigated some of the hardest years of my life and a safe place to grow into a more authentic version of myself. And when I was ready, this community was a safe thing to say goodbye to because I knew you would always be here. So I would always have a safe place to land or cry or study or say something brave or park my moving truck for a week. Y'all get the picture. My bio on the UUA website says, Helen was raised on love and coffee by Westside UU Church in Knoxville, Tennessee, because it is true. This community has raised me in every way that counts, and I wouldn't have achieved half my current success or well-being without you. This community and so many other UU communities already know how to embody the beloved community, even when we do it imperfectly, even if we've broken our vows a thousand times and we have to do the hard thing and work to remain in relationship with one another when it might seem so much easier to turn away. That's how I know that Reverend Dr. King's vision is not a pipe dream. 
It is entirely possible and it already exists if you know where to seek it. So what's next for me on this journey? Not entirely sure yet. I wish this call came with instructions or maybe a map. I wish I could get up here and say, hey y'all, God called. She told me exactly what to do. She wrote it down so I won't forget because I have ADHD and I forget everything. Um, she broke it down into little steps because that's how my brain works best. Then she got me a snack, gave me a forehead kiss, took care of all those pesky genocides that have been clogging up our news feeds, fixed the environment, and here's the plan. Listen, sometimes the call is loud, and sometimes it is poetic, and sometimes it is blunt. I would be disloyal to my call if I stood at a sacred desk and did not even mention that over 40,000 of our siblings in Palestine have been murdered by colonial forces in the last six months. The fog of propaganda, misinformation, black and white thinking, and fear of saying the wrong thing surrounding this situation has left far too many of us silent. I'd like to remind us that our primary symbol, the flaming chalice, was once a signal of safety to people escaping genocide. Perhaps we are the ones we've been waiting for. This world reveals new extremes of beauty and brutality every day, and something greater than myself is calling me to serve and witness the sacred in all of it. Trust me, I wish I could have been a kindergarten teacher or a stand-up comedian, or a nature photographer. But apparently that's how you know it's a call, when it's not necessarily what you want to do, but what you simply know you must do, even if you low-key hate it sometimes. I've occasionally found myself feeling jealous of people of faith with straightforward dogma to adhere to and ministers in denominations that don't have such a rigorous credentialing process. But those places are largely also where my identities would preclude me from serving as clergy where my unique manifestation of that great love would not be celebrated as it is here, but rather condemned. While I admit that I've threatened to quit the entire MFC process at least a few dozen times now, and I actually have formally quit at least twice, um, <laughs> And there does need to be a lot of conversation about the ableism, classism, and white supremacy culture embedded in the process. I know there is no faith I would rather serve and grow with than Unitarian Universalism. I know my call comes from something that transcends any labels we could give it or ourselves. At the end of the day, we are all beloved children of the universe, experiencing this strange and beautiful journey together. I am so thankful that out of all of the faiths and all of the faith communities out there, I get to call this one mine. Um, so some of y'all have asked me if I will be completing an internship at Westside or otherwise working here. And the answer is, oh heck no. <laughs> um, I have accepted that as a UU religious professional, I'm always going to be kind of on duty in UU spaces and that's something I've accepted for myself. I know that, I also know there's this thing that happens once you commit to becoming a minister and once you begin to embody that role. People start treating you like a minister. Weird, did not expect that. 
That's why I, um, I drop strategic swear words in work situations so people know I'm not that kind of minister. And why the woman who cut my hair last weekend asked me to pray for her son right after she asked me what I do for work. I did, of course, and I don't think it matters that the God of her understanding was obviously different from mine. But that strange phenomenon of people treating you like a minister is also why, ever since I moved home, coming to church has felt a little bit like going to work. And that's fine. That's something I signed up for. Westside has an important role to play in my ongoing formation, but it isn't as an employer. Westside's role is to be what you have always been, a safe place to land. Now, what exactly does that look like? Again, not entirely sure, but that doesn't worry me. I've worked with kids for about 16 years now. And one of my favorite things is when a kid asks me a question that I don't know the answer to. That way, we get to figure it out together and we both get to learn something new. As you use, we never stop learning. And that is one of my favorite things about us and our living tradition. This is new and different for us, like so many things are in the world right now. And I'm sure we're gonna get it wrong sometimes as we learn and grow together. And I'm just as sure that we're also going to work together to get it right. I am in the process of working out an internship with another local congregation that I hope to be starting this fall. Um, we're still in the finalizing process, so once I, I have news, I will be very gladly share it with you all. Um, but for today, I made some treats for, uh, to share for coffee hour. I made cinnamon sugar hala, and it's gorgeous. <laughs> um, and I hope y'all will stick around after the service a little bit so we can talk more about the process West Side's role in it, what my experience has been, all that good stuff. Um, I'd love to, love to answer your questions, and I'd love to hear your more of a comment than a questions. Uh, I'm so excited to find out what this next chapter will hold for all of us, and so thankful to be a part of this beloved community. Thank you for being a part of my journey. Yes, so we're gonna have the choir come and we'll do uh, from you, I receive number 402. Thank you. Um, does, um, do we have justice and generosity opportunities announcements? That would be great. Thank you, Elizabeth. Good morning. Um, so we are, I don't know if anyone read the membership column or membership blog that was in last week's newsletter, but we have finally been able to match our Share the Plate partner 
with the Justice and Generosity Project, and our Share the Plate partner is Knox Pride, and I have learned through some members here, the Tolars, and also uh, Judith Finer and her husband Mark, that they went down and, and visited Knox Pride uh, Center, and we are going to be working to supply their food basket, and they also have a walk-in pantry, a walk-in refrigerator that um, probably is not a good idea for us to supply, <laughs> but they also take um, personal care items, and I also want to reiterate, this was in the blog, that this is not in competition with the Farragut Food Bank that we are supplying. It's a different population, different geographical era, area, and both of them could use our support. So justice and generosity is to work with the Knox Pride Food Bank. Right. I have a closing reading for you, and then we'll do our benediction. This is another one that I wrote, and this was written, Henry, shh. I was, this was written um, last year, or a couple years ago, for my friend, um, Reverend Misha Sanders' installation at her congregation in um, Sandy Springs in Georgia. This is called This I Know. I have known everything that Pluto is a planet, that the world is safe, that time is gentle and kind, that all is well. I have been wrong more than I have been right, but this I know is true. Whoever you are, wherever you come from, whatever you believe, somewhere there is a table with a seat saved especially for you. Great love of many names, I may not feel especially qualified to be the one heaping hope into hungry hearts, but here we are. And what I know is I have had enough hope pressed into my palm like a lucky stone to make me believe there's a reason to keep going, at least on most days. God, let me be a peddler of hope, a connoisseur of joy, sommelier of silver linings. And on the days I don't believe a single word I say, let me remember in my bones that it is my time to be served. Let me drink deeply from the rivers of hope that fill my cup, this I know. My cup will never go empty. My table mates will not allow it. And soon I will again fill theirs. This I know, we will never thirst when we are together and hope has plenty of hiding spots, but she is always near. Beloved, may we always keep seeking, always keep striving, always remember we have a seat of honor at the table where hope is served. It's a tradition at Westside to join hands for the benediction if you're willing and able. If you're not, that's okay too. Just hold your hands up like this or whatever. All right. All right. Behold how good this is. Look at this beautiful community of people who never would have been in the same room together if not for this place, probably. Thank you for being here and being a part of this. You bring something critically important to this equation and we would not be the same without you. Go in peace and passion, blessed be. Mm -hmm.